Hey everybody, I'm back for my final review of the Legend of Korra series, or I guess second to last review, I'll explain a little bit at the end. But today was the finale of Book 3, Change, um, and for those of you who are super big fans of the finale, get ready to hit the downvote button because I thought the finale was absolutely terrible. From a strictly tor storytelling perspective, I think it was a disaster. I think there were so many storytelling things they just got wrong or was just utterly stupid. So let's g get into it because I'm really upset at how terrible it was, despite the fact that the very end of, la of the last episode, the very end of episode 13, I think was very, very good when we see Janora become the master. I thought that was fantastic. The problem is the rest of the two episodes were a fucking nightmare. So let's get into it. Episode 12 is called Enter the Void. And I feel like when I wrote this note at the very beginning of episode 12, I said, I feel like the show was just beginning to parody itself because Bolin interrupted a very, very serious scene with a totally unfunny and dumb fuck suggestion that took like a minute of the episode's time. And even Mako was like, dude, you're a freaking retard. Will you please stop? I, I feel like the show is, is like teasing us with saying, we know how stupid Bolin is. Let's just acknowledge it. How about you don't make him that much of a freaking idiot? That would be great. So, and then we cut to Korra willing to sacrifice herself to save the Air Nation, which is kind of interesting because she kind of ends up doing that. Although the end is kind of vague, so I'm not sure what's going to happen at the end of beginning of next book if they even get there. Um, but I don't think Zuko actually said Korra should sacrifice himself. He just said Aang would go to any length to save the Air Nation. Or save what he's built up. So I don't know if, that, if, if her saying Zuko said this is what Aang would do. I don't know if that's totally right. But, um, you know, who knows. So then we see the Red Lotus again. And I still have absolutely no idea what the Red Lotus actually wanted to do with Korra at this point. I think it's really... I think it, it's so weird to save the villainous organization's actual plan until right before they end up totally losing... Like, we don't actually find out what their plan is until next episode, like, at the beginning of it. And then at the end of that episode, they're already defeated. So I just think it's to they, they, they totally flubbed the Red Lotus and how they could have made that organization so cool. Especially since everybody, I think, except Zaheer, are very interesting characters. I'll get that into that a little bit more later. But um, So then I said, okay, the Pabu slash Naga scene was pretty funny. I liked it. Especially with the old woman coming in and, like, scolding them. I thought that was cool. And then we see Pali and Zaheer, and I didn't realize how freaking tall Pali is. Holy shit, she's a giant. Um, and like I just mentioned earlier, all of the scenes with the Red Lotus interacting with one another makes me so much more sympathetic to them as characters, except for Zaheer. Like, Pali, just hearing a little bit about her past, and it was very, very small. Just a really tiny amount we hear of her past. I thought was very intriguing, and I wanted to learn more about her. Unfortunately, she ends up dying at the end of this episode, so who, who, we can't. But I just thought it was, I thought it was very intriguing, and I wanted to learn more about Pali as a character. Um, but then we get like a stretch of ten minutes where it's just fighting scenes, and those are all really, really good. Um, I think some of the finest in either of the series. Um, Lin and Sue versus Pali was just fantastic. Tonrak coming to save his daughter was very great. Gazan basically melting the entire side of the mountain was, was awesome. Although, once again, lava bending still makes no sense. And av with the book now over, they have not explained it. And I think it's a huge down point of the series. It's one of the biggest problems I have with this season so far. And I am just, I'm just not going to stop bringing it up, people. So everyone can co complain about it, me talking about it every episode. But it's a huge hole in the lore that... They established in the first series, they established lava bending was fire and earth combined, but Gazan is just an earthbender and he can do it and they don't explain it. And until the actual show explains it, whenever earth lava bending happens, I'm going to bring this up because I don't care. I don't care what a fan theory says. I don't care. I want to know what the official lore of the show is. Do you understand? I don't care what a fan explanation is. That's A fan explanation is just a fan explanation. I want to know... I want to li I want to hear the logic of the show telling me what lava bending is supposed to be and how only an earthbender can do it. So I noted on my list and I swear I didn't know this at the time of writing this note. I said 
This is the note. However, I am absolutely sure that Bolin is going to become an airbender at the very last minute. They've been dropping hints for several episodes now. From the extended look on Bolin's face when Gazan Lava bent the room to escape, to his face when the lava was coming down the tunnel, I will be very surprised if he does not lava bend before the episode's over. That was the exact note that I wrote down when Gazan escaped. And guess what happens at the end of the episode? He lava bends. Um, so then the show cuts to Lynn willing to sacrifice herself to stop Plea while Sue tries to get the killing blow on her, and she does. And the way she spins around with the with the chain whips and all that stuff, she's such a freaking badass. Her role her role in this episode definitely solidifies my opinion that she is the best character on this show, um, and I just love her. But holy shit! They just straight up showed everything but the corpse of Puli in her death scene. That was a very smart move by Sue, but it was so, like, violent and just dark. She basically, she, you guys understand how she died, right? She exploded her own face is basically what happened. She's dead. Like, there is no, like, her head pro should probably be gone. And if the show was a little bit more mature, they probably would have showed a headless corpse. That's what happened to her. And holy cow. What a violent death, but I like it. I really like it. So, then we get to, uh, I can't order, I, I can't put an order on how, on things I dislike in the series, but if I did, this would either be number one or very close to the top. What the fuck? Zaheer can just fly now, guys. He just becomes Goku. Uh, it, <laughs> it makes no sense that Zaheer would be able to fly. Only one other avatar in the fucking history of the show's lore has ever been able to fly, and it's Guru Lahima, who was supposed to be an immensely powerful airbender. Zaheer just learned how to fucking airbend like a month ago! I don't give a rat's ass if he studied Lahima's, uh, Lahima's philosophy his entire life. He can do something that Aang nor Korra can do, and they're both fucking avatars. That's such... Goddamn bullshit. This show is so stupid. I think Zaheer's power set makes no sense. They never make any point to explain it. They don't even say why. I, it's so mind-boggling that they make a villain who is this powerful, and then he was not a non-bender. I kind of get what they were going with. Like, the whole point is like, oh, a non-bender became this super big villain. It's because Korra opened the portals. I get that that was the premise of the character. But the way they went about it is just so terrible from a storytelling perspective. You can't have a character whose who's power set makes no sense and never explain it. And then the season ends and they just not explain it. They never explain Zaheer's power set ever. That is such a huge hole in the season. I don't see how anybody can say this is a great season from that shit. When you saw Zaheer fly for the first time... That is the most bullshit thing, and everybody who watched it, I don't care how much you love the show, because I fucking love Avatar. I thought the first season was fantastic, I was totally on board with book one. Book two lost me a little bit, but I still thought it was very good. And then I went into the season hoping, expecting it to be good, and it was just terrible. I don't know how anybody who's not entirely biased can't say that shit is ridiculous. So... <laughs> Why can he fly? Why can he fly? He basically is Goku. He's Goku. They don't even... Ugh, you guys, you, you, you don't understand how much that bothers me. It's so ridiculous. But let's move on. And so my next note is, hey, look, Bolin Lava Bended. Who called it? And I said, oh, my God, everybody, what a surprise. It's not like they were totally hinting at it from the very beginning. Oh, and then Kai is there. What another surprise. The best show ever, guys. No Deus Ex Machina here. So clever and interesting storytelling. The only way that Tonamax survives is Kai randomly shows up, and he just happens to have seen where the bad guys took Korra. What a coincidence. What a great story that they're telling in this episode. Am I right? <laughs> I do like, however, at the end that, um, that Tenzin looks like absolute shit. I thought that was really nice. Um... He looks very much on the, on the edge of death, and I thought that was good. At least they didn't, like, show him with just a black eye, and that's it. And he was like, ready to go, I'm going to save Koron! And he, like, fights the next episode, which he doesn't. I like that they at least stuck to that for it to be consistent. 
even though nothing else is. So, you know. Um, and at the end of episode 12, my note is, what is even happening? What is even happening? What is even happening? Because I had no clue what was going on when they had Korra chained up, and she, like, breathed fire at Zaheer, but it stopped, like, in a really short range for no reason. It didn't seem like Korra was weak yet. She could have just blown fire right in their faces. Plea was already dead, so I don't know who could have been fire bending the fire away from them. She should have been able to just breathe fire right on them and kill them all. But I don't know. So that was my note. So that's episode twelve. There was a lot. <laughs> there was a lot that bothered me in episode twelve. But episode thirteen was as bad, or maybe even worse. Um, episode thirteen is called Venom of the Red Lotus, and um, we begin with the Red Lotus's ultimate plan, I guess, which we kind of know all of it because they didn't explain. They- <laughs> Okay, so their plan is to force Korra into the Avatar state with this poison and then kill her so there is no more Avatar. Okay, that's fine. And then they're going to kill all the world leaders. Okay, then. That plan isn't exceptionally short-sighted or anything with a high percentage that it won't, ju- it won't go the way they want. Why do they think that if they just kill off the Avatar and kill off all the world leaders that the peoples of those nations wouldn't just elect new leaders they don't have the red lotus does not have a huge standing force at this point that we're aware of there's more than the four of them uh we learned there was like what six or seven more guys who we see just random random grunts i guess of the red lotus but they don't have like a huge amount of numbers of force so even if they killed all the people they wanted what's stopping the people to just elect new leaders Here's my point that I brought up in like a couple videos ago where I was like, this is, this is the how they're going to do it. This is the how and the what they're going to do. The why is just non-existent. They don't say why beyond chaos is the true order of things, guys. Yeah. But they don't extrapolate on that idea. I wish there was something behind it. Maybe he says like, oh, chaos is the true order of things. Thus, blah, 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 blah. We're going to do some other thing once the chaos has been achieved. Or we're going to try and become the leaders that we think the world should have because all of the ones are corrupt. And I guess you could say, Necro, the point is they just want chaos and that's their end game. But that's such... Like I explained with with the old gods and with uh, Littlefinger a couple episodes ago, the way, they want to make chaos to do something else. Just making chaos, sure, it's a plan, but it's really goofy, and it, it doesn't. It feels like it's not a complete plan. I guess it's hard for me to articulate why I think this is so weird. I, I hope it made a little bit of sense. I wish they just would have extrapolated a little bit more and said why they want chaos. There has to be a reason why. So there's their plan, and then I said, "Oh, good, Jinora was a fucking ghost and heard the entire bad guys' plans." How fortunate for Team Avatar. What a coincidence. What a great thing for them. That's definitely not a deus ex machina right there. Let's count how many they can use before the series is over. We already got two. Wait, we have we have Kai randomly showing up. We have Bo, uh, Bolin lava bending, uh, which also they've never hinted at him trying to do before. We have Janora uh, randomly as a ghost seeing their plans, because that's great. Uh, so that's three. Let's see how many we can get before it's over. Um... But the next scene where Kor is beginning to, like, succumb to the poison and you see Amon and Unalak and Vatu, I thought that actually was really a really cool scene. It was a great callback. Um, one of the few really great moments of the episode, and I really liked it. So I, just, I had no problem with it. I thought it was really cool. I liked how, ultimately, I for some reason I hadn't realized this until they just showed that all of the bad guys of this season have pretty much had the same goal, or roughly the same goal, and it's that the Avatar is not necessary Let's get rid of them. And, of course, like, after that happens, each villain had their own thing. Like, Amon was like, I'm going to make all benders go away. And Unalak was, I'm going to become the Dark Avatar. And But still, all of their plans were like, the Avatar's bad and we have to get rid of her. I thought that was really cool. For some reason, I didn't really consider that until they showed that scene. So, good on the show. Again, it feels like you're trying to tie all of the books together. But, again, it feels like it's an after-the-fact thing that they didn't plan on doing the whole time. But they kind of forcefully wrote it wrote it that way at the end but still i thought it was cool so um and then we see the guard who's voiced by steve blum that was pretty cool that was nice and um so then the whole team except for core which is basically you know who 
Asami, Bolin, Mako, Lin, Su, Tonrak. I think that's it. They end up finding all the airbenders, and my note was, oh, look, the obligatory, quote, Asami takes out the final guard so she seems useful, quote, scene. That's pretty much all. That's pretty much all Asami did in the finale, if you think about it. She, she sat there, and then 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 she, she shocked that one guy, and then she sat there, and then she sat there, and then she did Korra's hair at the end. I don't know why they don't give Asami more scenes. I think she's a great character. Um, so, and then we see Janora talking to Kai, and Kai was like, I got exploded and fell like 100 million feet. That takes more to kill me. No, Kai. No, you should have died. Everybody knows you should have died. The fact that you didn't die is absolutely absurd and terrible storytelling because they blatantly suspended disbelief of fucking logic to keep you alive just to save Tonrak and just to uh, uh, have tell, to tell the group that, oh, I found out where they went. He, he should have been dead. I don't care if it's just because I hate him. I don't think that's... I think discounting that, he still should have died. The way he got hit and the, how long he fell, how his leg attached to the tree. At the very least, his foot should have been ripped off and he should have kept falling and he should have died. And it just makes no sense that he didn't. And it's just, again, terrible storytelling. So, then we get, uh, oh, hey, look, Cora begins to escape. Um, my note was, why did they assume that she wouldn't be as powerful as she ended up being in the Avatar state? The poison's only purpose was to bring her into the Avatar state, or so that, or so they actually, they told her, or so they told her, they told her that the poison was going to bring you to the Avatar state, then we're going to kill you. Why didn't they think she was going to be super powerful and escape? Again, what? they would have been better served, like, tying her up into that contraption and then poisoning her, like the Earth Queen did, when she captured her, uh, Korra. What there was no indication. Again, it's it's just little. It's a bunch of little things that add up to a big giant problem with the story. Korra, when you become the avatar in the avatar state, you become immensely powerful. And just holding her up with four chains onto the rock, no wonder she escaped. Why would they not expect her to go berserk and just start taking them all out? This, these might be the dumbest villains ever. I think actually. Um, so then we see uh, Mako and Bolin going to fight ming and Gazan. And again, I wrote this before the actual episode ended and I found out what happened, but my note was, Mako, why the fuck are you not using lightning against her? It would beat her in a second and she would lose. I'm not going to say I called exactly what happens later on in the episode, but what a fucking surprise when he uses lightning on her and he wins. Um, I also thought it was really cliche to have the Lava Bender fight the Lava Bender. Um, it feels very juvenile storytelling to have that happen. And it really didn't go anywhere. Um, like, like really, it didn't, doesn't go anywhere. It was more of a scene to, for Gazan to realize Bolin knows Lava Bending. And that was the whole point of the scene, which doesn't matter because then he kills himself later on. So, I don't know what the point of that scene was. Again, my note is, why can here fly? Somebody please tell me why the fuck can here fly? This is not Dragon Ball Z. You should not be able to fly around like that in this universe without a glider. Or at the very least, some kind of visual effect of the air going around you. They didn't even have that. They just had him literally flying like they fly in Dragon Ball Z. That's so utterly lazy. <laughs> I just, I don't get it. At the very least, at the very least... Show the air flying around him. Because him being able to fly has something to do with the air. They should be showing air happening around his body. The only time they show air is when he, like, almost hits the ground. But that's not because he's air or he's flying. That's because he's, like, flying towards the ground and flies up at the last second. So it's basically kind of like just the dust, like, uh, the dust moving out of the way before he hits the ground. That wasn't the air bending, showing him flying. They should have showed that, and I don't know why they didn't. I thought it was so stupid. Um, and then we get the scene of Tenzin immediately after saying, he's unlocked the powers of airbending that haven't existed for a thousand years. Why, Tenzin? Why? Why can this one person do this? Why and how? Um, again, so next note, ming is freaking awesome. Those four or five seconds when she's just all out attacking Mako were great. She had, like, more more than eight arms at that point where she's just shooting all of the arms at him and he's dodging out of the way. I thought that was so cool. I think she should have been the actual main villain. She's the only one that I felt like 
was truly evil, if it makes sense. Gazan was kind of just like going with the flow. Pli just was kind of going along with it because she had some kind of loyalty to Zaheer for helping her. Um, Zaheer is just a totally dumb character. I feel like Ming Wah should have been the actual enemy because she seemed legitimately evil. Um, my next note is, oh my god, he used lightning against her and he won. It's not like he could have done that from the very first time they fought. What a selective, uh, just forgetting that he had that ability. Why did he not shoot lightning at her when they fought at Zhao Fu? At the very least, they could have showed him shooting lightning toward her and she dodging it out of the way in Zhao Fu and uh, Mako kind of realizing lightning would work on her and then they call back to it in this episode. Why? It's little setups like that. Don't just make him not do it and then just suddenly do it when they need her to lose. That's so terrible story. That's such a bad way to tell a story. Oh, I... Why? And this is the uh, this is the writers who made the first series. The exact same people. Did they just blow their whole load on the first series and just forgot basic writing tropes in the next series? I don't get it. <sighs> next note is, well, Gazan just totally killed himself. Despite knowing the fact that Bolin can earthbend and lava bend, why would he think they couldn't escape? What a stupid end to a character that could have been more interesting, discounting the lava bending part. I think everything besides the, the question of how can he lava bend, I thought Gazan was a really interesting character. I thought him just killing himself was really dumb, like I said. He just saw that Bolin knew how to lava bend, and he's an earthbender. Why would he not be able to escape? I don't know. Um, so my next line is, we see Korra fall, like, tons and tons of stories, and my, my note was, most of Korra's bones should be broken by that fall she took. And I guess we do see her in a wheelchair at the end, but it didn't seem because her legs were broken. It just seemed because she her, her whole body was just poisoned so much that it couldn't really move much. But her legs, like, should have legitimately been broken. Like, she fell a long time and then landed on her feet. They didn't really even show, like, they showed a little bit of air as she was hitting the ground, but she was going really fast when she hit the ground on her feet. She should have had her legs broken. Uh, and so then we, we get this, the, uh, the final fight, I guess, if you want to call it. It's not even really a final fight. Korra just loses and loses and loses and loses again. And then all of the airbenders save her at the end. Um, my note was, if her, if his plan of taking the breath out of Korra's body failed because the giant tornado was sucking, uh, that away, why didn't he just straight up start just, like, choking her? Like, cause he had a long time before he ended up getting stuck into the tornado and falling or getting grabbed by the chain, uh, and then slamming into the ground, why didn't he just start, like, literally choking her around the neck? Like, I know that might have been violent for Nick, but once again, I feel like this is another reason the show should not be on Nick, because it also would show a level of desperation, which I think would be really great for this character, because I don't think Zaheer as a villain didn't go anywhere. He was his character plot. It just went... It went completely straight. We didn't learn anything new. We didn't find anything interesting. Him flying was bullshit, so I don't even count that. It would have been cool to see him realize that I can't do the poison method anymore. I can't suck the air out of her. What am I going to do? And then he just starts choking her. I think it would be really cool to show that desperation of him as a villain right before he dies. Because I feel like a lot of, a lot of amateur storytelling... They don't take into account that the villain, if the villain was being realistic and if it was a human, if the villain's a human and they're trying to be realistic and the plans of the person completely fail, but at the last minute they still could accomplish it if they just do like a desperate act, that would be much more realistic, I think, and add a lot to the story. At the very least, it'll add a second smaller depth to the character because you see the hero throughout the whole series, except for when Pli dies. He's totally calm and cool and collected. And even after he dies, he's only freaking out for like a minute. And then immediately in the next episode, he's totally calm again. Um, I would love to see him like realize my plans failed, but I can still do this and try to choke her. I think that would be really cool. So who knows? Um, and then again, uh, I think the way that they um, they help Korra, because uh, Zaheer at this point is defeated. He's stuck in the rock by Sue and Lin. But then he starts laughing and saying, oh, the poison's been in his system too long, her system too long. She's going to die anyway. The Red Lotus win. And then Janora just out of nowhere goes, the poison's metallic. You can save her. Is the, is the implication that she saw more than the show p portrayed to us? Because we saw her witnessing as a ghost their plan. I don't remember them ever saying that it was 
that it was metal poisoning. I guess you could say maybe she inferred it from the way they were making the metal, the poison go into her body when she was hung up. But Janora wouldn't know that those were earthbenders versus waterbenders. Why would she not also just assume that it's poison? That's what I thought it was. I didn't believe it was metal at all. I thought it was just straight up poison that was like liquid, liquid poison, like watery, kind of like where water would be involved. And that's how they like split it up when it, and put it in her body. Did I miss when they like imply that it was metal? I think it was very, very vague. And thus Janora saying, you can save her, it's metal. I thought that was just ridiculous. It was ri another ridiculous the deus ex to add on to the very top of the cake before the episode ends. I think we're up to four or five Deus Ex Machinas now that they've had in the last two episodes. Who knows? So, so here's defeated. The day is saved, I guess. Korra is still really screwed up. And I don't know if it's just because I really want this to happen, but I was getting kind of a lesbian vibe from Asami during her, her scene with Korra. I really hope if the show goes off Nick, they explore that possible angle. So I guess I'm a total Korra and Asami shipper. I just think it would be really cool to see, like, a show like this take on, like, a homosexual relationship without it being, like, just a uh, cliched or a caricature. Like, I think it would be really cool. Because I, I, re I felt like the scene where she takes her hand and is like, I'll be here for whatever you want. I don't remember exactly what she says. I was like, oh, shit, they're going to end up together. Maybe that's why neither of them could deal with Mako, because they were secretly gay. Or at least bi. Who knows? I thought, I <laughs> the moral of the story is, it would be really interesting, I think, if the next book... They were together. They would never do that on Nick, like at least not overtly. But uh, hopefully, the show doesn't go on Nick next episode, next season, if there is a next season. But that's that. I want Cora and Asami to end up together. That's, that's what I want to happen. Um, and so then the episode ends, and I say, uh, "Oh, Bald Janor." I really feel like this Bald Janor looked really awesome and uh, shook like a freaking badass. That whole scene was just fantastic. Too bad the rest of the finale was such a freaking nightmare. Um, I just, uh, if I had to give it a vote on a scale of 1 to 10, the finale would probably get like a 3 from me. I just do not think it was good. I don't even think my complaints here were nitpicking for the most part. Um, I think maybe one or two of them might have been. Um, but I think overall... There were a lot of storytelling problems with Korra, uh, book three. I think it's to the point that, like I said on Twitter, I might be done with the show. I don't even know if there's going to be a book four, but if there is, if if this is the kind of writing we're going to get on book four, frankly, I don't want to watch it. I, I've given up. I've given up hope that they're going to make it better. It's very disappointing because I felt like the last two episodes were way better than the last than the whole season actually. I thought that episodes 10 and 11 were probably better than the rest of the season combined in terms of at least not being terrible plot holes and just ridiculous storytelling. So who knows? That's my thoughts on the finale. Um, let me know what you think and how much you think I'm just wrong about everything because I've learned just like every other fandom out there that you are not allowed to have any problems with Korra without everybody jumping on your case. So if you think I legitimately have a point wrong out of if you think i'm just legitimately incorrect or that i didn't see something in the, in the episode that would have maybe helped a problem i had please leave those in the comments below um specifically about the poison i i really it's one of those things where i think i think the way i portrayed it was right but i could have missed i feel i just don't seem like it, it it doesn't seem like they made they made the fact that the poison was metallic clear enough not nearly clear enough that janora would know that it's metal and that they could, that, that Sue and Lynn could take it out of her body. Like, there's no way. Also, why didn't they pick Lynn for that? Like, Lynn is much more connected to, to Cora than Sue is. I even though I like both of them. I love Sue and Lynn, but whatever. So leave any comments you want in the comments below. Just note that if you're just going to hate on me because I don't like, I don't, if you're just going to hate on me because I don't like the episode, don't even bother because I don't care. Like, I, I, this is something I wish people would realize. I've gotten a downvote on every single episode immediately after I release them. And I have an idea who it is. I think it's just this fanboy on Twitter that I pissed off, like, weeks ago. I just want to let those people know if they actually watch this far. Downvotes don't really do anything negative to videos. Just, like, a little hint from YouTube. It actually helps people because it's getting notoriety. Like, YouTube's algorithm is kind of like, oh, 
you're getting upvotes and downvotes on stuff, so clearly your video must be at least capturing some kind of interest. Just, just, just the little hint, by the way, just a little hint. So, but, but honestly, down, downvote it if you don't like this video, that's fine, but if you're going to downvote it to try and spite me, I just want to let you know it's actually going to achieve the opposite of effect. It's going to give the video a little bit more of notoriety, so... Uh, so again, once again, thanks for watching, everyone. Leave any comments in the comments below. Uh, like I said at the very beginning of the episode, I'm considering. I was I, I was convinced I was going to do it, but after having done this whole episode, I feel like I've said almost everything I can say about this series. But uh, let me know if you think this is going to be a good idea. My my a suggestion I got from somebody, and I'm sorry I forgot who it was at the top at my off top of my head right now, but. They suggested that I go and rewatch the entire series in one shot. Uh, they're team the entire season, excuse me, all of book three in one shot, and then give my thoughts again, because I guess the assumption is maybe I would like it a little bit better, or maybe because Korra as a show is crafted around, because it's so short, it's crafted around like watching it in that way. But if you think that might change my mind a little bit, uh, tell me in the comments. Um, I'm not really planning on doing it now that I think about it unless people really want it. But these videos are never too popular on my channel anyway. So let me know if you think I should do that is the point. Um, but other than that, thanks guys. I'll see you for more uh, Warlord of Genor beta. Um, we're doing the second half of Nagrand. And then we're going to be going into all the dungeons. So thanks for watching guys as always. And I'll see you next video. So peace out guys. Farewell.